Good evening, everyone. I'm Lisa S. Koiko, president of the City College of New York, and it is truly my pleasure to welcome you to the Samuel Rudin Distinguished Visiting Scholar Lecture, featuring a conversation with the Honorable Sonia Sotomayor, Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. The Samuel Rudin Distinguished Visiting Scholars Program at City College was established in 1996 to provide opportunities for the college community to interact with outstanding scholars, business leaders, and government officials to enrich the educational experience on campus. The program also fosters communication within the academic community of New York City. Samuel Rudin, a civic and philanthropic leader, was a member of the City College class of 1918. The Samuel Rudin Distinguished Visiting Scholars Program is supported by a generous grant from the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation. Previous Rudin scholars have included Tom Brokaw, Susan Lacey, Rick Burns, Walter E. Mosley, the Honorable Mario Cuomo, Walter Conkright, and Nobel Laureate Dr. Harold E. Varmus. I especially want to thank Jack and Susan Rudin and Mark Bodden, Vice President of the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation for their amazing and continuous generosity that allows students, faculty, and the community to enjoy this incredible, valuable experience. I would also like to recognize this evening Aspira of New York, a nonprofit organization working to foster educational excellence and civic responsibility among young Latinos. Aspira Youth Development Clubs, dropout prevention initiatives, and after school programs serve more than 8,000 young people each year in the five boroughs of New York City and in Nassau and Suffolk counties. We are very lucky this evening to have with us students, chaperones, board members from Aspira. Um, and I could ask you, those members of Aspira, could you please stand and be recognized? Thank you. You make a difference in the world, and your lives and the lives that you transform make a difference globally. So thank you, thank you for everything that you do. And now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing the Honorable Sonia Sotomayor, Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Born in the Bronx, Associate Justice Sotomayor earned a bachelor's degree from Princeton University, graduating summa cum laude and receiving the university's highest academic honor. She later earned a Juris Doctorate from Yale Law School, where she was editor of the Yale Law Journal. During the next 13 years, she served as Assistant District Attorney in the New York County District Attorney's Office and an associate and then partner for Pavia and Harcourt in New York City. In 1991, President George H.W. Bush nominated Justice Sotomayor um, to the U.S. District Court then, Southern District of New York. She also served as a judge to the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. In 2009, she made history when President Barack Obama nominated her and she assumed the role of Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, becoming the first Hispanic and third woman to do so. So another round of applause as I present <laughs> Honorable Sonia, Sonia Sotomayor. And I know you've had many honors, but I would also like to st extend to you this evening that you are now considered a daughter of City College. <laughs> the 
This evening's conversation with the Associate Justice will be centered on her new memoir, My Beloved World, and will be conducted in three parts. First, pre-selected questions will be presented alternately between me and my colleague, Lynn Diorio, Professor of English at City College. We will then listen to readings from My Beloved World by Associate Justice Sotomayor. Finally, the audience will pose pre-selected questions about the memoir, and this will be moderated by Carlos Riobo, who is the Chair um, of Foreign Languages and Literature here at City College. So with that, I am going to begin this evening's pro uh, program. Thank you again for coming. Generally, I hate being up on podiums. And I hate being so far away from you. And I would actually get off the stage, but you're too big for me to do that and for people to hear me. So I have to sit up here. I'm about to drive my marshals crazy. <laughs> Pull your chairs up. You're just way too far. Get up. Pull the chairs up and come closer. Oh, that's the garment. They are going to get crazy. <laughs> come on. Um, what are we going to do? Oh, come thank on. you. Come on. knows better. <laughs> Run better. over this much, better. much better. Because it was kind of weird. Yeah, it was too, it too seemed too formal. All right, I told you all that I was going to drive these guys nuts, so you got to sit down so we can start. <laughs> Now, is the, the microphones are on? Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? <laughs> no. Can you hear me now? And I, well, you can certainly hear me. <laughs> um, I, I may switch with you if. Why don't I move that one over here? Yep. Or we could do that and then yeah, that's go back and forth. And then you can move your chair and I'll do that. No problem. All right. Let's, this is working. All right. Hello? Okay. 
Yes, I will start. Uh, uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Much better. <laughs> Much more intimate, isn't it? I've you know, I, I, I don't know how many of you read my book, but there's a passage when I explain that nobody, when I was a DA, could say my last name. Most people can't. And I understand why they can't say your last name either. Yeah, that's right. So, President Lisa, how about we turn it to Justice Sonia? It's a lot easier. <laughs> I will do that. Thank you. All right. I am Professor Lynn Dioria from the CCNY English Department. I also teach at the English Department at CUNY Graduate Center. And I've never seen the Great Hall this way before, so I'm just really amazed. And I really like this uh, talking to the audience really close up to the stage. So I have a few questions for Justice Sotomayor about her book. Uh, sure. I think you have to speak like Can my teacher's voice. Can you hear me now? No. I don't think this is, Here we go. Is, the, is it the mic? Okay, yeah. I'll take this one. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah. Ah, that's great, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so I want to ask the justice about the epigraph of her book first, to start off. The epigraph of your book is, forgive the exile, this sweet frenzy. I return to my beloved world in love with the land where I was born. It comes from a famous poem by the 19th century poet, Puerto Rican poet, Jose Gautier Benitez. But you were born in New York, not in Puerto Rico. So why did you choose this epigraph? And also, I'm wondering, did it have something to do with your grandmother, your abuelita's love of poetry, which you describe in the book, how she used to declaim poetry at family gatherings? When I started to write this memoir, at one point I said to my editor, you know, I don't want to write a woe is me memoir or one about all of the tough parts of my life alone. Because if I did that, I didn't feel that it would convey the optimism that I have, both about life and my experiences. And so when thinking about my title, I wanted a title that would convey the specialness, not just of Puerto Rico, but of all the worlds. And hence, I remembered the poem, and I remembered the phrase, and I thought to myself, I want readers to explore my beloved worlds. And I should have put an S at the end, but my editor wouldn't let me. <laughs> and I think he was right, okay? Um, poetry, as you will learn if you haven't read my book, and for those who have, was a part of my life from when I was a child, but poetry in Spanish. And for those of you who speak Spanish, you know that there's a beauty in the language, because it's a romance language. And because of it, it is musical. Our declamations are all, they all rhyme, they all convey a story, and they talk in words that are un, both evoke emotions and paint pictures. In the end, I became a lawyer because I like painting pictures with words and making a story. And that's what I wanted this memoir to read like, not a poem, but to paint pictures with words so that when people read the book, they would carry their own images in your mind because each of us, when we read things or hear a word, create a different picture in our own mind of what that might mean. But I wanted your pictures to be as vivid as the memories were for me. And so I thought the best way to convey it was first to find a title 
from a poem, but then to start the very opening of the book with a passage from that poem. Um, my grandmother gave me many, many gifts. The love of poetry was one of her first and everlasting ones. And one of the most beautiful passages in the book has to do with um, the justice's grandmother reading poetry at a gathering. You can hear? Yeah, you, you can, yeah. yeah. One of the most beautiful passages in the book has to do with the justice's grandmother reading um, this poem that is quoted at the beginning of the book at a gathering and how the justice tears up and, you know, is, is filled with emotion. And, and I would say from the book, you did a beautiful job in conveying those pictures because as I was reading the book, the aromas in the kitchen, the, the sights, the sounds, I, it, it was so real. It, it was amazing to me and you know a lot of us come from large extended families of one kind or another and it brought me back to you know my Italian American you know Sunday dinners but but the the way you describe the words and the feelings you can you could so they were tangible and touchable thank you because then I succeeded oh thank you, you. did um, The book, though, also, you are very optimistic, but what I also loved about the book is you did give a very honest account of your childhood growing up, and you did have many challenges, uh, from being very poor, from having an alcoholic father, from having juvenile diabetes from a very young age. Um, and yet you surmounted that to become truly one of the most famous women and powerful women in this country. How did you approach your obstacles or did you see them as obstacles? I'm wondering how you approached your life. You can't deal with sadness and not feel sad. That's true. You can't feel, deal with trauma without recognizing that it leaves scars. But you can live your life not trying to surmount things and not trying to hide them, but to accept them as part of what you are. Because they get woven into the fabric of you as a person. What you can do, and I see many people who do, is to take that fabric and lament its existence and spend your life looking at it as a negative. What I have, think, has been the most helpful to my life is trying to figure out what each of those experiences taught me. How did it make me a better person, if at all? Some things didn't make me a better person. I, I talk in my book about how some of those early experiences initially made me a very guarded and closed person. I had to teach myself how to be open and how to be more loving with people. It wasn't something that came naturally from the things that I had experienced. But every experience can help you learn something. Something about you, sometimes something about others. And sometimes the things you learn about others are not necessarily all that good, okay? I loved my father. I understood and I call it that, I call it an illness, his alcoholism. I had someone write to me recently who read my book and said, it seemed as if you forgave him. And I said, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. I didn't forgive the things that he caused, the unhappiness that he promoted around, the, uh, around everyone who loved him, but I understood. And those are two very different things, but I, I don't think of it as surmounting. 
I think of it more as this is who the person has become because of these experiences. So you took each thread and you wove it into a beautiful tapestry. I have tried. And as in all tapestries, some is richer, some hues are deeper, yeah. some are lighter, some are not nearly as captivating, but they make a whole. Because your, your father disappears so early on in the narrative, um, I was wondering what the long-term effect of his death was on you. You describe the aftermath, and I'm wondering, did it have a, a longer-term effect on you? The one who suffered was my mother. Yeah. You know, um, and, and I see it now, regrettably, among my cousins who lose dads, the ones who are left behind to be the disciplinarians, to be the supporters of the family, to be working hard all the time, um, it takes a while for them to be appreciated because that lasting memory, even of the unhappiness, mm -hmm. is making the memory grander than the reality. And so I spent a good portion of my life, I talk about it in the book openly, resenting everything my mother didn't do. Yeah. And, and part of this book is in talking about how parents and children need to grow together, to walk the paths of life, not individually, but in each growing with the other. And that's actually a lesson that took me a very long time to understand, that my mother was taking each new experience as I had and gathering herself the good parts of it. Um, it's one of the things I communicate to first-generation immigrant kids or even kids who leave their nest and go on to experiences that their parents never had. And many of them ask me, how do I stay connected? And my response is often, by not disconnecting. Mm -hmm. Bring your parents with you. Talk to them about your experiences. Don't assume they're not going to understand. They may not have had a similar experience. But if you talk to them, more likely than not, they will try to understand. And let them share the highs and the lows with you. First, it takes a certain amount of being grown up enough not to be ashamed. And all of us have had parents who have shamed us at one time or another. I spend most of my time right now having parents push their kids to take pictures with me. <laughs> There's a couple of them who already had that experience yeah. <laughs> tonight. They were here in the front somewhere, okay? And I often look at them and say, parents will, will embarrass you for the rest of your life. I'm 60 years old and my mother's still doing it to me. <laughs> Get over it earlier. That's true. Let, let them come into your life, no matter how strange or new it is. Bring them with you. Don't leave them behind. Because they're not disconnecting from you. You're disconnecting from them only if you make that choice. Very wise advice. That from is a wise a, Latina. That's, <laughs> that's right. It's very wise. I think the president is. Yeah, I'm, I'm good here, though. I have my mic. Um, there is a very poignant moment in the book when your cousin Nelson, who seemed to be really more like a brother to you, uh, died of a drug overdose. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how that affected, because you started off, it, it appeared on very similar paths and things diverged. And could you talk a little bit about that? If you can. I, I, when I finished my book, I didn't 
show it to many people outside of the circle of people who were helping me with editing. Um, and I kept being asked if I was going to show it to my family, and I said, no. Because <laughs> I knew there was a danger, and the danger would be of editing. Um, because I think that's people's instinct when they read about themselves. They don't want you to say this, they don't want you to say that. And I got a little worried. Uh, um, but the one person I showed the book to was my cousin Miriam. Nelson's sister. And I said to her, I disclose things about him that many members of our family don't know about. Nelson's aunts from his father's side didn't know he died of AIDS until they read this book. Um, and I knew that I was disclosing things that might be painful to her and to her mother, my Aunt Carmen, whom I adore. Miriam called me up. She apparently started the book one night and didn't sleep and read the whole book and told me that after she finished, she spent the rest of the night crying. And she got up and talked to my aunt and called me up and said, you brought Nelson back to life. And if his story can help save one kid, then it was worth retelling. And so I live with the hope that in sharing Nelson's story, that some kids who read it will appreciate that there are different paths that there are different choices. And he and I started in the same place, but made different choices. Yeah. I talk about the fact that some of it was machismo. He was allowed to play in the streets unsupervised. I was a little girl, and I wasn't permitted to do that. Um, he got exposed to drugs in a way that I was protected because I was in the bosom of the care of my aunts and actually my older cousins because my older male cousins were the ones who often accompanied me to events in the South Bronx. They were my protectors. And so, but some of it was his brilliance. As I describe in the book, Nelson was a heck of a lot smarter than I was. He was just brilliant. I tell in the book how anything I wanted to know, I would go to Nelson and he would tell me about it. Because he read incessantly. But I think he spent so much time worried instead of doing. Mm. Please be seated. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lisa S. Koiko, president of the City College of New York, and it is truly my pleasure to welcome you to the Samuel Rudin Distinguished Visiting Scholar Lecture, featuring a conversation with the Honorable Sonia Sotomayor, Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. The Samuel Rudin Distinguished Visiting Scholars Program at City College was established in 1996 to provide opportunities for the college community to interact with outstanding scholars, business leaders, 
and government officials to enrich the educational experience on campus. The program also fosters communication within the academic community of New York City. Samuel Rudin, a civic and philanthropic leader, was a member of the City College class of 1918. The Samuel Rudin Distinguished Visiting Scholars Program is supported by a generous grant from the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation. Previous Rudin scholars have included Tom Brokaw, Susan Lacey, Rick Burns, Walter E. Mosley, the Honorable Mario Cuomo, Walter Conkright, and Nobel Laureate Dr. Harold E. Varmus. I especially want to thank Jack and Susan Rudin and Mark Baden, Vice President of the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, for their amazing and continuous generosity that allows students, faculty, and the community to enjoy this incredible, valuable experience. I would also like to recognize this evening Aspira of New York, a nonprofit organization working to foster educational excellence and civic responsibility among young Latinos. Aspira Youth Development Clubs, dropout prevention initiatives, and after-school programs serve more than 8,000 young people each year in the five boroughs of New York City and in Nassau and Suffolk counties. We are very lucky this evening to have with us students, chaperones, board members from Aspira. Um, and I could ask you, those members of Aspira, could you please stand and be recognized? Thank you. Us here. <laughs> and also, um, are you a spiritual person as well? I meant it. Mommy, mommy threatened to disappear with me if grandma taught me her ways. <laughs> and that was the one threat that mommy could make that grandma would listen to. And so she never did. All right. I have a healthy respect but I don't practice. <laughs> My mother will tell you that I'm lucky at bingo. I am. <laughs> she says I'm lucky at poker, but I'm, I know I'm just skilled. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, is it a gift or is it just sensitivity to people? I don't know. I, Strange things happen to you and you can attribute them to that sort of thing, but it's really ridiculous to do it. Um, I never, ever, ever pick up the phone in my house without letting it go through an answering machine. Because as you can imagine in my position, a lot of people that you don't want to talk to call your home, including reporters, okay? And so, but unerringly, if it's, a person in my family in need, I automatically pick up the phone. So the ringtone is no different, but something in me tells me no. that I need to pick up the phone. Um, am I spiritual? I'm a moral person. I talk about that in my book. I think we as people have choices. We have choices about whether we choose to be good, caring, and giving people, and whether we choose to be selfish, not caring people. That's the choice every human being makes every day of their life. And to me, that's morality. When you're presented with a choice, is your first question, what helps that person or what helps me? And that choice is the one that defines who you are as a human being and your morality. Is that religious? Religion talks about choice, too, in different ways. 
but it is ethics and it is a strong sense of how you want to live in this world. And everybody has that choice to make every single day. I often tell graduating classes when I'm giving commencement speech to kids, when you fall asleep at night, your first question should be, what did I learn that was new today? And your second question should be, what was it that I did that was good today to someone else? And if you can't answer both of those questions, don't fall asleep because your day hasn't finished. <laughs> that is wonderful. I think it's the, the president then. I'm going to switch gears a little because I'm sure we have a lot of um, women in the audience, students in the audience, and there's this myth very often that women can be super women. They can be perfect in home life, perfect at work, and they can figure out ways to balance it. Can you talk a little bit about those challenges that you've experienced? There ain't no such thing. There is exactly. no superwoman. I, I wear on my car key chain a Wonder Woman tag. <laughs> Everybody who sees it laughs, and I go, just to remind me, I'm not. <laughs> um, to talk about balance is to suggest, as I think the talk often is, that there's a way to have it all every single minute of your life. That's a fallacy. It's a joke. You can't do everything at once. You can't be a perfect mother. You can't be a perfect worker. I don't know a working mother who, when she's at work, isn't thinking about what her child is doing and what experience her child is having that that mother is missing. And when they're with their child, they're thinking about what's on their desk and what remains undone that they're gonna suffer the consequences for the next day or later that night. And they're gonna be hard choices between the two. The day you have to miss an event your child has because you're gonna appear before the Supreme Court, I'm gonna tell you you're gonna to come to the Supreme Court. All right, if you're a professional woman. Um, you're going to go to your commencement and probably your school's commencement and hopefully you'll try to talk your child out of having their, ch their commencement the same day. <laughs> My point is that you can't be a perfect anything. You have to, at each moment, make choices. The good and bad choices, the same choice about what do I do at this minute and where is the need greatest at this moment? And you, the only balance is, how do I, what do I do when? Not can I do both things at the same time. What is gratifying about it, I think, is for women, and this is not discouragement for you, that there are plenty of professional women who do it, and do it with some burden, mm -hmm. and do it at moments with regret, don't let anybody fool you that it's perfect all the time or that there aren't moments of sadness and moments of disappointment and some professional moments where if something happens to your child, you have to give something up because at that moment your child's need is greater or vice versa, your work need is greater. But despite all of that, your children will grow up strong your children will grow up respecting the fact that you're a person who has chosen to give to them and to give to the world at the same time. And that has value. It has value to you as a person and value to your children in the message that they're able to carry about their own self-worth. 
and about the freedom of choice that they have in what they want to be. And for those mothers who choose to stay home, just as for the fathers who are choosing to stay home now, we will reach equality when every single person, male or female, can make the choice they want and not feel guilty about it one way or the other. So my, my last question um, is very simple. What was your favorite part about writing this book besides the fact that it reached number one on the New York Times bestseller list? <laughs> You know, I've had a lot of firsts in my life. First Hispanic, Latina Supreme Court Justice. Um, the first Puerto Rican Latina Justice on a circuit court. Um, the first to swear in a vice president. <laughs> um, being number one on the New York Times bestseller list perhaps was the most unlikely accomplishment I've ever had. <laughs> From the kid who started college not knowing how to write a full English sentence, wow. it's been quite a journey of love writing this book. It gave me a freedom my legal writing has never given me. I'm a, uh, I'm a storyteller in real life. Um, I think people who have heard me speak spontaneously at other events know that I love telling stories. And when I sat down to write this book, both my editor and my writer friends kept saying to me, Sonia, don't worry about the grammar. I even have split infinitives in this book. <laughs> You won't see one in one of my legal writing. Very poetic ones. Yes, no, no, no. I, I, I was, I came to it as a book about stories. Mm. Stories with a message, because that's what good stories are. And by doing that, I liberated a literary sense within me. I haven't quite figured out how to do that in my legal opinions. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot harder. I have managed in my dissents to have my own voice. But in majority opinions, I'm still writing within my craft. So the book's experience, I hope, that I can translate into more graceful legal opinions with time. I'm aspiring to that. But there were so many memories that this book opened up for me and my family. Um, my brother, who also read the book, said, you almost brought me to tears. And for my brother, that's a big thing, you know? Um, my mother read it in stages because She's aging, and her eyes are not as strong. And for three nights in a row, because it took her three sittings to read it, she called me up crying each night. Oh. Um, telling the stories. But as with every book, it had many layers of purposes. The first and most important layer was my favorite line in this book. 178, because I know a lot of you have the book in your hands. It really captures 178, the reason that I wrote this book. And the way that I conveyed it was by describing someone else, my mentor, Jose Cabranes. And in describing that meeting and what he meant to me, I wrote the, the following words. When a young person, even a gifted one, 
grows up without proximate living examples of what she may aspire to become, whether lawyer, scientist, artist, or leader in any realm, her goal remains abstract. Such models as appear in books or on the news, however inspiring or revered, are ultimately too remote to be real, let alone influential. But a role model in the flesh provides more than an inspiration. His or her very existence is confirmation of possibilities one might have every reason to doubt saying, yes, someone like me can do this. It's the message of this book. Um, I've taken a lot of um, uh, objection to a line I used in my uh, nomination speech to the Supreme Court when I, decide, when I describe myself as an ordinary person who's been blessed with extraordinary experiences. And some people would challenge that I was an ordinary person. I wrote this book to show everybody how I was an ordinary person. I'm everybody in this room. I have had many of everyone's experiences here. I've had my own set of sadness and heartaches. I've had my own set of insecurities. I'm still racked by them. As confident as I seem on the outside, I'm still mush on the inside, like the rest of you. And what I tell kids all the time, and it's absolutely true, if I could do it, so can you. Um, and that was the joy of writing this book. Now, God knows as the timekeeper, can I read them another package, passage? I love it. Ah, okay. I'm turning to page 106 and 107. I, I started by telling you earlier how much fun it was to remember things that are stories in this book. Um, I'll describe something else before I describe this passage. Um, I tell a story about Little Miss Echo, the doll that had a tape recorder in its chest and repeated everything everybody said. <laughs> and I love that story. And I had nowhere to put it in the first draft. And my editor got the first draft, and he asked me for an example of how I was a curious child and an observant child. And I called him and I said, Eureka, I can plug in little Miss Echo. <laughs> it proves a point. Well, that's what storytelling is about. There has to be a purpose to every story. So let me tell you the story, and I hope that you will find it as charming as I did in remembering. But then we can talk about the lesson I took from it and the lesson I hope readers, among others, will find in it. It's about my dating my, the man who was to become my husband. and We met in high school, okay? On our first date, we took the train down to Manhattan. We walked the entire city, walked for hours, talking as he showed me his favorite spots. The first place he took me was a tiny park on East 53rd Street, where a curtain of water still runs down a stone wall. The sound of the fountain makes the city seem far away and turns the vest pocket park into a private cove. From that first date, we were inseparable. For the first month that I knew Kevin, he brought me a rose every single day. 
One time after school, I was walking with him to the stop where he caught, where he caught the bus home to Yonkers. We passed by Titi Gloria's house, Aunt Gloria's house, and I dragged Kevin in to meet her and Tio Tonio, my uncle. Really, I just wanted to postpone our parting. But as soon as we got there, Kevin turned pale and clammed up. I thought maybe he was put off because Titi, Gloria, and Tio Tonio kept switching to Spanish, even though they were making quite an effort, welcoming us with cake and cookies and sodas. But Kevin remained stony, and I was more than a little upset by this. The next day when I got to school, there was no rose. I was getting seriously worried that things were over between us. But finally, Kevin confessed. He had been stealing my daily roses from Tio Tonio's garden. <laughs> He looked at me with a hangdog expression that didn't go with his sparkling eyes and said, there's a lot of them, Sonia. <laughs> it was true. The Otoño's rose bus bushes were magnificent. I laughed so hard I almost choked. I was happy to accept that the rose-colored phase of our romance was over now we were just a couple. <laughs> There's a lesson in that package, in that passage. You can make assumptions about why people are doing what they're doing. We do it all the time. How often does someone say or do something that hurts us and we get angry and attack them first? Happens regularly among couples. Happens with our parents. It happens with our friends. Because we project onto others often things that they are not feeling or aren't thinking about or don't intend or mean. Relations are better when you don't start from the assumptions, but you simply ask why. And often human relations are improved when the question is why instead of why not. Why didn't you do this instead? Instead of asking, why did you do it that way? Understanding starts from that point. And that, if you read this book, you will see the very, often the very moments in which I had those moments of understanding, in which I came to a moment where I would ask the question of why. Why did the police officer take the fruit from the street vendor without paying? And I found my own answer. It was because he couldn't put himself in the shoes of the vendor to know that that was a part of the man's profits meager profits for the day. That's often why we do hurtful things. Because we don't try to figure out the why. And so the book was almost therapeutic. I had somebody ask me, uh, a journalist asked me if I had gone through therapy. And I said, no, the book was really good at that. <laughs> And now I'm going to turn this over to Carlos Riobo. Hello, everyone. I'm Carlos Riobo from Foreign Languages. I work on Latin American literature and culture. 
I am uh, I'm delighted and moved to be here now. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Justice Sotomayor if she's doing anything over summer recess. She might help us with our events planning. She just accommodated so many more people in this hall. <laughs> I, am, I am amazed and I am so thankful because there are, I understand, 1,600 of you or more, and this is fantastic. Uh, I'd move the podium up if I could, but it's, it's nailed to the ground. Um, so this is a segment in which the justice will answer questions from the audience. With the overwhelming response to this event and a fully packed Great Hall, as well as an overflow room or two, we had to limit questions as well as pre-screen them. Otherwise, we'd be here all night. <laughs> um, we did a call for questions from the CCNY community that followed Justice Sotomayor's general policy for speaking engagements, which is, the justice appreciates that audiences would like her to comment on current issues. However, she believes that the public will lose confidence in the judiciary if justices opine on cases or issues before they are heard at the court. Moreover, the justice does not answer questions on issues that may come before the court, pending cases, statutes, or proposed legislation. Furthermore, she does not express her views on the conduct and opinion of others, and she will not pick among people as her role models or favorites. Lastly, the justice will not explain or define her opinion in any way. I'm not gonna fight with you, in other words. <laughs> That said, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, all per, oh sorry, I always wanted to say that. Um, let the questions begin. Our first question is from Professor Barbara Siracos, Department of History, CCNY. I would ask that she and everybody else make her and their way to the center where there is a microphone and uh, you shall be heard. <laughs> I'm not sure if you'll be heard unless there's a wireless microphone. Okay. And will the justice have one to answer? Are, are you I able got to? one to Perfect. answer. Okay. So this will work. Justice, ooh, is this okay? That's perfect. I have a foundational question. Uh, and that foundational question simply has to do with your definition of justice. And I think it meets all of these criteria <laughs> or exclusions. You have uh, young people here in the audience and um, how would you, I'm a little nervous, how would you begin to uh, talk to young people uh, in terms of, you know, what, con what constitutes justice, what goes into justice as a complex notion, uh, what, what, what does justice mean to our justice here today? Thank you. If you're looking for justice in the courtroom, you're looking in the wrong place. And let me explain, and let me explain why. In a legal case, there is a winner who in inevitably, because they've won their claim, will tell you that they got justice. But every time you have a winner in a legal case, what's the opposite, guys? Somebody lost. Somebody lost either a claim they thought they had or a position that they thought was defensible or a right that they relied on but were told didn't exist. To that person, it's not justice. So to define justice by a legal outcome is to pardon the pun not to do justice to the word. To me, what justice means is what good lawyers, and I will define what good lawyers are, do. Lawyers, if they are passionate about their work and their profession, are people who are helping others 
have better relationships. Lawyers should be helping people solve their problems. They should not be causes of aggravating them or causes of tension or dissension between people. A lawyer's job should be of service, of helping people and institutions better their relationships with one another. And that is what justice is to me. How do we share the limited resources that we have in a way that permits us all both to live in harmony and with dignity? That's justice. The sense of being a community that is inclusive and not exclusive of people and ideas and feelings. If you want to come into the law, come into it only if you're passionate about helping the world and the people you serve in that way. And I tell young lawyers, it doesn't mean you have to work for government. It doesn't mean you have to work for community organizations or not-for-profits. It means you just have to do whatever your job is, whether it's a private or public job, in that word I gave you earlier, in a giving way, in a good way. That's what justice is about. The better cases are the ones that are settled out of court. They really are. Because the only one who wins in a legal battle are the lawyers. They get paid. Juanita Arias, who is a member of ASPIRA, will ask the second question. Buenas noches, Justice Sotomayor. Oh, my name is Juanita Arias, and I am a member of the Latino youth organization ASPIRA. ASPIRA empowers Latino success by supporting them in their academic and educational paths. Sweetie, pull the microphone away from your mouth just a little bit. Okay. You've got a good voice projection and okay. it's muffling you. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so ASPIRA supports our growth, not only educational but personal. ASPIRA unites us no matter if we are Puerto Ricanos, Colombianos, Dominicanos, Aspira makes us one team. So I would like to use this opportunity that Aspira gave me to be here with you today and ask you this question. Which will you say are the most important characteristics one must have in order to succeed in very competitive fields such as politics and government? Thank you. You must be curious. You have to be curious about the world. You have to be curious about what everything means and how it works. You have to be willing to ask that why all the time. And not just of people, because to be successful, you have to have a measure. You have to read people. You have to know what they like, what they want, and the reasons why. But to succeed at anything you choose to do, you have to have that sense of adventure, that sense of curiosity that drives you constantly to say, I want to learn something new. I want to do something new. I want to have a new experience that can help me give more in what I'm doing. That's that attribute of perseverance that I was talking about, sticking to it. But what it means is sticking to the concept that learning is important. I often tell people, learn for the sake of just enjoying to learn. 
I have, a, I have problems sometimes with competitive schools now because kids are driven to study to get good grades and they're forgetting to study to just learn and enjoy themselves in learning. Um, and I don't want to drive you away from getting good grades, but if that's all you're doing, figure out what extracurricular activities you can do that are fun that'll let you learn something that you know nothing about, but you just want to experience it. Whether it's acting in a school play, or like I did in forensics club, because I just wanted to learn how to publicly speak, okay? It could be anything, but do it because you're enjoying it, because it's fun to do. Um, remember to be curious about living. I think in the end, that's what drives people to be successful. The people who get ahead at jobs are the ones who are always walking around trying to figure out, what could I do next? And it's not because they're brown nosing, it's because they're afraid of getting bored. And they want to go out and do something new and something different in their work. And they're the ones who get promoted. And they're usually the ones that are overworked, but that can be fun too. <laughs> Good luck in everything you're doing. I told the students from Espita that I'm so proud of them. They, it takes a lot to go out of the cushion of your school community and reach out to an organization that will teach you more than your little nest has and will introduce you to other skills. I'm very proud they're doing it. Kate Adler wrote the next question. She's a liberal uh, studies student, uh, Graduate Center of CUNY. Is Kate here? Yes, yes great. Um, good evening, Justice. If we as a country were to unite in a serious undertaking to address poverty, how would you suggest that we begin our efforts? What question should we ask, or ask ourselves in outlining a national effort that is systematic and pragmatic? How do you suggest that we think about disaggregating and prioritizing the myriad factors involved? I would put all the factors aside except education. I would start there. And I wouldn't start in high school or college or middle school. I would start in, I would go back to starting in Head Start programs and in grammar school. Look, there is no question that the road out of poverty is education. And I'm not talking about financial road. Um, you can be poor and contributing to the world in extraordinary ways, but the people who do are the people who are doing things that excite them and that are meaningful. And you really can't figure out how to do that unless you've educated yourself enough to know what your alternatives are and what the needs are and to help yourself figure out how to fulfill those needs. We are doing a horrible job with education in this country. There, I'm not a politician, I'm a citizen talking right now. I'm talking about the need of elevating the quality of our education starting at the very, very beginning and improving and fostering that appetite for learning that only comes through developing learning skills. Reading and writing are things that you learn. They don't come naturally. It's shameful that I got through school and it was not until college that I learned to write a full sentence in English. And it wasn't the lack of my school's trying. It was a lack in the educational model at the time. And that model, regrettably, is still present in so many schools. We need to prioritize 
our attention to where it matters. And at least for me as a person, it has to start in education. It ends, it starts and ends there. Until we can master that problem, we will not deal with the economic disparities of this country in a meaningful way. Karen Chikas uh, will read the next question, but variations of, of this question were also submitted by Martin Cruz, Anastasia Regna, and uh, these are students from the Skadden Arps program. So it was four people who gave more or less the same question. <laughs> so you get to present it. Good evening, Your Honor. Um, I have the questions, but first I'd just like to say that you're an inspiration. I know that to many, but you're an inspiration to me, so thank you for that. Um, the questions are, what advice would you give to a woman or man who is preparing to enter the legal field as a law student or attorney? And what do you wish that you had done, known when you started your law school days and then your career? Thank you. There's so much I didn't know when I started. Um, I, my only image of a lawyer when I started law school was from Perry Mason. <laughs> Pretty, if you rely on television to tell you what lawyers really do, you're in trouble, okay? Um, and, and lawyers don't just do lawyering. So many lawyers, um, President Lisa and I were talking about it. So many lawyers do other things. Um, so many of our presidents, including our recent one, was a lawyer. But many of our businessmen, uh, many people in journalism, if I had known that, I think I would have realized that um, I shouldn't have thought of lawyering just in terms of what work do I do? I would have thought of it as what, can, what service can I render that will make me happier as a person? Too many young lawyers get so worried about paying their student loans. So many of you in college are worried about that, and I really respect it. But once you let the question of what job you do be driven by how much money you're earning, you lose sight of what's the purpose of getting the education to start with. What is it that will make your life more meaningful? You will have more success as a law student if you think of it not as a competition between you and your classmates, or in a law firm, how am I going to do better than that other associate? But to figure out what is it, what experience am I getting from this institution that's helping me become a better person and a better professional once I do it? It's not the body of substantive knowledge, because you can study that at any time. It's a way of thinking, a way of serving, a way of doing things that improves your experience. And so if I were a young law student today, I would be taking courses in areas that I knew nothing about, simply because they would teach me how to be a better professional with greater knowledge. So, if you want to be a civil rights lawyer, learn a little bit about business. Because there are going to be organizations that you're suing that are going to be business organizations, and you should understand what motivates them. Everybody in your family is going to ask you about writing a will. <laughs> Take a trust in estates class, OK? It's valuable. Take a taxation class. Everybody pays taxes. 
When you go out to work, identify what will teach you the most in terms of the skills you need to develop as a young lawyer. And learn that skill and apply it to work you want to do. And if it's not the work of the job you have, because I went to a private law firm that I ended up loving, but I went because I knew there were skills in civil litigation that I had not developed that I thought would be useful to me. And I'm eternally grateful I did because as a judge, I needed to have those experiences. But I also volunteered in different community organizations and satisfied my need to serve by doing those other things as well. So it really is, as an experience, figure out how to squeeze out of it the most in learning. And in the process, enjoy it. Because the minute learning becomes a drudgery, then you're no longer learning. You're probably just going through the motions. And that's just no fun. So good luck in everything you're about to do. Stay excited about it. When it gets overwhelming, take a deep breath and sit back and remind yourself of the good reasons of why you're doing it. And if you can do that, it'll become more enjoyable and of an experience for you. Have fun in the adventure, okay? Marlene Doro from the Skadden Arps program has the next question. Good evening, Your Honor. My question is, considering that you grew up with humble means in a poor section of the South Bronx, but you attended elite institutions of higher education and have risen through the ranks of the judiciary, has it been difficult to adjust to the new environments in which you have been only one of a few Latinas and have been surrounded by people of more privileged background? It's never easy. And to this day, people say things that I have no point of reference. And, you know, I came from these very elite institutions and I've lived in worlds far from the ones I grew up in. But there are things, sayings that people have or things that they do that I still find myself lacking in. Um, I do talk about in my book being a student for life because it's not as if there's deficiencies in my background. It's just that it's different. And when it's different, you're always going to feel a little bit out of place in something that's not familiar to you. Um, I often comfort myself by thinking about bringing one of them to a family function. <laughs> and I have. And it's wonderful to watch them squirm for a little while. <laughs> and then to be overcome by the warmth of my family. Because the one thing you learn, um, and I have learned, is that it doesn't matter what your background is, how rich or how poor you are. We really do have similar emotions about life. Rich people suffer too. Rich people have sadness and happiness in their life. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, remember the Shylock words from the Merchant of Venice when he's talking about how he bleeds, like Jews bleed like everyone else, okay? Now mind you, he was talking about the sameness of people in the context of revenge. It's not a good reason to know that we're the same like everybody else, okay? <laughs> but it's a very moving statement that he makes. And we often forget that. That's what prejudice is about, is people forgetting 
that we're at core the same, regardless of how different we look or how different our languages may be. We're motivated by the same things. And so in all of those situations, I spend time trying to figure out my sameness with them, not my differences with them. And the commonality often is ground enough to begin feeling comfortable. Professor Jerry Carlson will read the next question. He's a professor of comparative literature, producer at CUNY TV, and my fellow chair in the humanities and arts. Good day, Justice. Um, let's return to Princeton, where you did actually rather well. And uh, so, for other people, in what undergraduate courses did you encounter the kinds of critical thinking issues that prepared you for law school? What inspired you about the issues and the ways of addressing them in those courses back as an undergraduate? Nothing. <laughs> and I didn't want to. One of the reasons that I wanted to go uh, become a lawyer um, is that I wanted a liberal arts education. I was going to be lawyer enough, I knew, when I got to law school. But I was missing the vocabulary of the world, and I knew that. I knew nothing about economics, and I took a course in economics. I knew nothing about sociology, about the relationships of communities and power and people within them. I have used some of that in my lawyering, but not directly. It was more about understanding the world and its structure. I took a psychology course because I had heard someone use the term Freud and Freudian, and I didn't really understand what it meant, and I wanted to. Um, I took courses in philosophy, religion, um, I took courses in history and in politics, not because I planned to be a lawyer, but because I loved history and the lessons it teaches you about the world and its cycles. Um, for me, the value of a liberal arts education is not in what you use it to learn a vocation, although some people do establish some basic skills in college, but it's in how it forms you as a thinking citizen in general, being an informed citizen, an informed person. That's what I think being an educated person is about, learning how to read Shakespeare for the love of reading it, not because I'm gonna quote it as a lawyer. Um, although I have quoted some Shakespeare lines in, <laughs> in speeches, I, ha I just did. Um, my, my point is that it wasn't about becoming a lawyer when it was in college. It was about using college to explore the world. And I tell, especially the people in this room who are now in college, I know making a living is important. I know that training yourselves in some profession is important. But don't forget to use a liberal arts education for its greatest value, to learn about things you know nothing about. This is your opportunity to do this. Explore topics that interest you just for the sake of interesting you. Take classes of things you've heard about that you've been curious about and you know nothing about. It goes back to being that interesting person. That's the value of college. That's the value of the courses that you should take. How do they teach you to have fun learning? And, and I think that's the most critical skill in analytical thinking. It's how to examine a, a problem in whatever class you're in, 
whether it's philosophy, religion, economics, sociology, psychiatry, any of the ones I mentioned. And how does that feel explore its answers? And from each one of them, you can draw a method that will help you in a different situation. Because the more you know, the less likely you're becoming routinized in your responses to things. The most creative lawyers are the ones that I know, are the ones who can get a problem and think out of the box. Think of a solution that's not obvious, but come from a different analogous field and apply principles from a different area to come up with a creative answer in this one. But it takes a wide berth of knowledge to be able to do that. And I think that's true of any task you undertake in life in any profession. So it's the rigor of thinking at all that's important. Joel Sati, Skadden Arps Pre-Legal Studies has the next question. Good evening, Justice. During your time as an undergraduate, you found that the Latino community at Princeton was vastly underrepresented. You took steps to, re to change that, such as petitioning school leadership. What would be your advice for those looking to fight for underrepresented communities in a college setting? Regrettably, I don't think our needs have changed much since I was in your shoes. We're still underrepresented in too many professions, particularly in the sciences and math professions. We still have too many kids dropping out of high school. We have too many kids starting but not finishing college. We don't have, although the numbers are better in an institution like City College uh, or City University, we still don't have enough representatives in the learned professions teaching. Our needs remain the same. But I think that the greatest need is that you who are in schools right now remain ambassadors to your communities. You are the examples for the kids who come from your families and from your communities to aspire to. I talked about um, wanting in my, through my book to provide sort of a living model for others to try to be inspired by. But I meant it when I said it's a real person in the flesh that provides inspiration. And if I were going to do something different than what I did when I was in college, is I would have gone back more to my high school then to talk about the people I left behind about the importance of education and of going on to college. I would have talked to the kids in the Latino organizations that I was a part of about the importance of applying to the schools I had applied to and the why of it. Um, but it is important to spend time going back to your communities now and encouraging both your family members and your community kids to get schooling. Show them by your example and by your leadership that graduating is important and getting a college education is important. We're very fortunate to have time for two more questions, uh, the first of which will be uh, uh, by Fadjan Kadyas, Gadden Arps Program. Good evening, Justice. Uh, my question is this. Since I moved to America, I made a lot of friends of Puerto Rican descent, and I know that they are very connected with their families, cousins, and relatives. I'm curious to know how much your career has affected your family life. I'm the only one who lives in Washington right now. And it's actually painful, because I'm a New Yorker by background. Washington's a very lovely city. 
and it's my official home now, but it's not the home of my heart. All of my relatives are either in Puerto Rico or in New York, and it's hard. I miss important moments in my family's life. Um, my aunt celebrated her 90th birthday, Titi Gloria, the one that I mentioned in the passage, and all I could do was call in to the party. Um, and it's something for all of you, some of you who may be away from home or away from your parents, and there may be a large group of you for whom that's the situation, where the bulk of your family lives elsewhere and you can't get back to see them as much as you would like. That is a price of the kind of life we live now where people are traveling and living in far distant places. But connections come in ways that don't require always physical proximity. I tell the story of my grandmother sending me an envelope with a dollar bill wrapped up in a napkin every week. All right. Um, was it the dollar bill? It was worth a lot back then. But it was the thought that kept me connected. And today you have the internet and you have Skype and you have um, telephones that have unlimited calls of some sort. Um, it is what I talked about earlier when I said, don't disconnect from your family. Stay in touch with them and share with them what you're experiencing. Try to explain it to them. Because sometimes in you trying to explain it to others, you begin to understand it better yourself. You know, the worst enemy one has is talking in your own head. Because it's hard to hear when you're talking to yourself. And so often it's a little bit better to talk it out with someone who can make you hear yourself a little bit. I'd like to ask uh, Ingrid Bilowich, Skadden Arps program, to ask the final question. There's a lot of you guys from Skadden Arps here tonight. I'm very pleased, thank you. Yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, You're kind of doing the lawyering I like, so thank you. Thank you. Um, so my question for you is, how did your time as a district court judge inform your approach to cases that come before the Supreme Court? I've been asked that a lot, and it's in, in good and bad ways, okay? I think, and, and the same thing is good and bad, I'm very record-oriented. Because once you've been a trial judge, you know that your job is to build the record for the appeals court who's going to look at what you did to decide if what you did is right. Is it supported by the evidence? Is it legally reasoned adequately? Um, has it been argued in an understandable way? And what are you ruling on? So you're record building. When I was on the Court of Appeals, you are a court that really applies the law as the Supreme Court has given it to you. And you're trying to stay true to the guidance that the court has given you. And so there's more attention to precedent, more attention to um, the record as it exists before you. When you get to the Supreme Court, that can be a problem. I'm still very record oriented. I'm the justice who will ask probably the most questions about the facts of a case. I'm the justice who probably tries to understand the arguments as put forth by the parties than any other justice. 
And I attribute that a lot to my training as a district court and appellate court judge, but more as a district court judge. The problem with that is that when you're on the Supreme Court, the cases are before you because there's no clear answer. Um, we only take cases when they're circuit splits. And for the non-lawyers in the room, there are 13 circuits in the United States that listen to the appeals from the trial courts below and who opine on what they think the law means. As you can imagine, when there are 13 different courts looking at problems, you get splits among the courts. Sometimes they're one-on-one -on -one splits, meaning you know three circuits this way and four that way, because not all 13 necessarily look at all the problems. But sometimes, and we've had a couple of these cases in the last two weeks that I was in court, the splits are three, three, two, one. So you can imagine how complicated the question is that there can't be unanimity among the 13 courts or even close to unanimity about what the central issue is. So the Supreme Court can't rely on precedent alone because precedent, if it was clear, wouldn't create the split. And it can't rely on the record because it's trying to develop a legal rule that gives guidance over a doctrinal question, question based on doctrine. And so it's more sort of above that way of judging that you might do on a district court or an appellate court. It's a different kind of focus. And so for that reason, the effect I think is a good one because I remind my colleagues of what the record is and what the issues as litigated by the parties are, but it doesn't always mean they welcome it. How's that? <laughs> Thank you, Justice. Thank you, Justice Sotomayor. Thank you, audience. I now turn the can microphone I, over to President. Can I say the Lee. following? There was a reception planned when the school thought that there were only going to be about six or seven hundred people. Um, when the crowd more than doubled, it was clear that I couldn't meet even a fraction of you in a reasonable amount of time. But do know that's why I wanted you to come closer. This has been fun for me. And thank you for the honor you've given me of being here. And, and I also um, want to thank you so much. Please. Justice Sonia from President Lisa. Just a small token of our appreciation and thanks for the wonderful conversation. Thank you. And thank you to Lynn and Carlos and to everybody here this evening. If I could ask you all to stay in your seats while we leave, it will make it easier for us as we process and we go out. But thank you for joining us on this wonderful, wonderful evening. And it was such a privilege, a privilege to see you, to speak with you, and to meet with you. Thank you so much. Thank you.